Now we're going to look at the bones of the appendicular skeleton. The appendicular skeleton consists of the arm and arms and the legs and the way the arm and the leg attach to the rest of the body. Uh, right now we're going to look at the bones of the arm and we're going to start with the way the arm is attached to the torso. Uh, this bone here that is shaped kind of like an S is the collarbone. The proper term for the collarbone is called the clavicle and you have two of them. Each clavicle has got two edges. It has got one side that attaches to the sternum and it has another side that's more flattened and this side attaches to the scapula and helps form part of your shoulder joint. This bone is called the scapula. The scapula is vaguely shaped like a wing. The scapula has got different surfaces. This is the posterior surface. The posterior surface has got these irregular structures on it. If we flip over the bone to see the anterior surface, you can see how smooth that is. This side of the bone is going to be attached uh, by muscles to the ribs of your rib cage. Then we also can find that this bone has got a medial aspect. This is the part that's closer to the midline of the body, and it has a lateral aspect. And this area here is the shoulder joint. The scapula also has a dorsal part or a superior aspect and an inferior aspect. So this would be closer to your feet. This would be closer to your head. When you look at the scapula, there are several parts of the scapula you need to know. This is called the spine of the scapula. And if you follow the spine of the scapula out, it runs into this structure. This is called the acromion process. There's another process here that to original anatomists, it looked like the head of a crow, and this is called the coracoid process. In between the acromion process and the coracoid process, we have this area. This area is called the glenoid cavity. It's also known as the glenoid fossa. The shoulder joint is formed by the acromion process, coracoid process, glenoid cavity, and also partly by the, I got it backwards, also partly by the clavicle, okay? Now, let's look at the bone of your upper arm. The bone of your upper arm is called your humerus. The humerus is, is sounds a lot like the English word for being funny, which means being humorous. So if you've ever hit your funny bone, you were actually striking part of your humerus. The humerus also has got two different sides. This is the area that goes closer to the shoulder, and this is the area that will form part of the elbow. If we're looking at the area that is gonna be part of the shoulder, we can see that there is a structure that kind of looks like half of a tennis ball, maybe. This is called the head of the humerus. And near the head of the humerus, we have these two knobs. Each one of these knobs is called a tubercle. This is the greater tubercle, and this is the lesser tubercle. Looking at it from the side, it's not so obvious which one is greater and which one is lesser, but if you look straight down from the head, down the shaft of the humerus, it's pretty obvious that this is the greater tubercle and this is the lesser tubercle. When you go partway down the shaft of the humerus, you will find a roughened area. This is called the deltoid tuberosity. The deltoid tuberosity is very obvious in people who used their deltoid muscles a lot, maybe were muscular or strong, but in the bones of elderly people who were sick before they died, it can be hard to find. Now we will go to the distal end of the humerus. The distal end of the humerus is designed so that a part that kind of looks like knuckles faces forward. This is the anterior part of the humerus. The posterior part of the humerus 
uh, you can see the knuckles face away. So posterior, anterior. Now the anterior part of the humerus has got a small dip in front, which is called the coronoid fossa. A fossa, which is F-O-S-S-A, is the name for a divot in a bone, sort of as if you'd taken your thumb and pushed it into soft clay and you left a little well behind. That's what a fossa in a bone looks like. And this is the coronoid fossa. Uh, if we look at the posterior aspect of the humerus, we find a very large fossa. This large, fo large fossa is called the olecranon fossa. And then if you connect the olecranon fossa to the coronoid fossa, you will run your finger through a groove that is called the trochlea. The trochlea is a joint surface and it is one of the joints inside of the elbow. Now, we're looking at the humerus again from the anterior aspect, and on either side of the bottom of the humerus, we have the epicondyles. This is the medial epicondyle, and you know that is the medial epicondyle because if you look up here, you recognize that the ball of the shoulder is going to be on the medial aspect of the humerus. So medial epicondyle and lateral epicondyle. When you feel your elbow right here with your fingers, you are putting your fingers on the medial and lateral epicondyle of your humerus. There's one more joint here at the distal humerus, and that is this one. This structure is called the capitulum and the capitulum is going to be the second joint inside of the elbow. Now, I would like to go next to this bone, which is called the ulna. What's nice about the ulna is the name of the bone, ulna, begins with a U, and it has a U shape built right into the bone. By the way, this U-shaped structure is called the trochlear notch. Now that sometimes annoys people when they first hear it because trochlear notch and trochlea, why do they have to sound so much alike? Well, actually, they were trying to make things easy for you. This U-shaped structure of the ulna called the trochlear notch is going to attach onto the trochlea of the humerus, just like this. So when you are bending and opening your elbow, you are uh, gliding the trochlear notch of your ulna along the trochlea of your humerus. Now, this is the anterior surface of the humerus, and this is the coronoid fossa. So it shouldn't surprise you to hear that this is the coronoid process. When you close your elbow, the coronoid process of the ulna is going to dip into the coronoid fossa of the humerus. And then when you straighten your elbow, straighten, you'll see that this part of the ulna is going to hide in the olecranon fossa. This aspect of the ulna is called the olecranon process and when you straighten your elbow, the olecranon process of the ulna is going to hide in the olecranon fossa of the humerus. So to recap, this is the coronoid fossa, the coronoid process, the trochlea, the trochlear notch, and then the olecranon fossa and the olecranon process. And they fit together like that. Okay. What else do we want to know about the ulna? The other thing you need to know about the ulna is the name of this pointy area. The point at the distal aspect of the ulna is called the styloid process. All of the styloid processes are called that because they're pointy and they reminded the original namers of, the, of a writing instrument or a stylus, kind of a, a ballpoint pen.
Now, also in your forearm, there is a second bone. Inside of the forearm, there is the uh, ulna, but also the radius. The radius has got two ends. The radius has got one end that kind of looks like an eraser, or some people think it looks like a hockey puck. And that is how you will recognize the radius. The radius is uh, hockey puck area is called the head of the radius. The head of the radius articulates, forms a joint with the capitulum. At the other end of the radius, you will find a pointy end, which is also called the styloid process. So now we are getting down to the wrist and the hand. Here is an articulated hand. These are the bones of the wrist. They kind of look like little pebbles. Actually, each one of these has got a unique name, but for AP120, you just need to know that these bones together are called carpal bones. The carpal bones are the bones here in your wrist. The bones of your hand, the bones that make up your hand, are called the metacarpals. There are five metacarpals, and they are numbered starting with the thumb. So this is the first metacarpal, second, third, fourth, fifth metacarpal. These are the bones of the hand itself. The bones of your thumb and finger are called phalanges. And the phalanges are also numbered starting with the thumb, one, two, three, four, five. And in addition, the phalanges are distinguished as being proximal, middle, or distal phalanges. So if this was the hand that was wearing a wedding ring, your wedding ring would be sitting on the proximal phalanx of the fourth digit.